from uh, New York City, from Broadway, is here for session number two of three. Uh, we worked with him the week before we went to spring break, and we're looking forward to working with him this week and also one hour next week. Jeff, take it away. All right. Hey, guys, if you can, uh, if you're not performing or talking, can you go ahead and mute? Because I hear Star Wars in the background, which makes me jealous. I wish that I could be watching Star Wars right now, but we can do that after the session. If you can just mute for me, that'd be great. Um, today, we're gonna, do, uh, we're gonna do a masterclass setting, which is something that I do with a lot of groups when they come through New York. We um, you know, get a, a group in uh, and then take kids one at a time to perform a monologue or a song or um, you know, any kind of audition material. And then I coach them one-on-one -on -one in front of a group and the idea is that everything I say, hopefully, will be applicable to you in some way, even if you're not performing. So if you are performing, of course, there's uh, very specific things that you can, you can take from hopefully what, what I give. But even if you're not performing, uh, this is the way you learn and get better. It's the way I've always learned and gotten better, is by watching other people go through the process of learning and getting better. So um, I hope that even if you're not performing today, you can take something from this and um, and apply it to your own performances. So uh, I assume we're not going to have any songs today. We're doing monologues. Is that is that true, Mr. Yeah, Ray? Right. We've got a couple. Mo I've got at least one monologue and a couple duo duologues as well. Oh wow, wow! This is going to be exciting to uh, <laughs> do over this medium. Um, yeah, great. Well, who would like to go first? Would should, let's go do some uh, warm ups real quickly. Oh, sure. Um, to get some articulators going. Um, students, just do me a favor. Uh, let's go ahead and do some um, tongue twisters just to, to get the articulators going. Say with me, say, uh, or say after me, round and round the rugged rocks, the ragged rascals ran. Round and round, round the rugged rocks. He usually. He usually. Say usually. 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 Usually urges an umbrella upon us. Usually. Who would like to say a tongue twister? Me. Um, go ahead, uh, Abigail. Susie sells seashells by the seashore. Everyone, repeat that. Susie, Susie sells seashells by, by the seashore. Eliza. <laughs> um, itty bitty Betty bought a bit of bitter butter, and that bit of bitter butter made her bitter batter better. Wow. wow. <laughs> why, like, why? I'm going to let you try that again. Try that again, Eliza. Well, itty bitty Betty, Betty, Betty bought a bit of bitter butter, bit of bitter butter, and that bit of bitter butter, and that bit of bitter butter, bitter butter, butter, butter made her bitter batter better. Excellent. How about uh, the one from uh, Singing in the Rain, Jeff? You know this one, right? Moses supposes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's all do this one together. Go. All right, I think we're ready. <laughs> you need to watch Singing in the Rain more then. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Jack Hague, are you ready to show us a mock vlog? Yep. Okay, so Jeff, Jack, hey, um, Jack just finished playing the role of, oh my goodness, Olaf. Olaf. Um, and this was one of the monologues that he auditioned for the role with. All right. Great. And Jack is in sixth grade. All right, Jack. Okay, this is Elephant in the Room, and I'm Jack Hague. I have finally confirmed it. My parents are crazy. Last night, I heard them arguing, and they were talking really quiet. So naturally, I snuck up to the room and listened in. That's when I heard my mom say, Honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What? I've never seen an elephant in their room or even in our house. Obviously, we would all know if there was an elephant in their room. 
Then my dad said, shh, the kids were here. Like he didn't want us to know there's an elephant in there either. So apparently they both think there's an elephant in their room. So I crept up to the door and I looked through the crack in the door jam. I could see my mom sitting on the bed and my dad across from her. And sure enough, no elephant. Then my dad said something I couldn't hear. Then my mom sounded really mad and said, well, it's crazy you prefer her to me. So apparently the elephant is a girl elephant. And my dad sounded really mad too and said, I work with her. What? My dad's an accountant, not a zookeeper. Tomorrow after school, I'm going to sneak in there and find out once and for all. And just to be on the safe side, I'm going to make my big sister come with me. Wow. wow. Nice. Uh, Jack, can you do me a favor? Can you turn the computer around so that uh, we've got, I don't have the window in the background. Wait, where'd you go? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to pin you. There we go. Yeah, it'd be better if I can just get light on your face. Let's see, wait, can you put it like in the windowsill or something so that I have direct light on your face instead of shadows? Oh, yeah. yeah that's Is that possible? Okay, now we got an up angle, but that's still, that's okay. That's better than nothing. Um, first of all, <laughs> awesome. That's terrific work uh, and very funny. I can't believe you're just in sixth grade. That's excellent. Um, okay, so here's something we're gonna talk about. Um, that, that applies to everybody across the board. And really, it's the foundation of any monologue. It's the foundation of any solo song you ever sing. It's the foundation of any audition, of any scene work you do. Um, when you're speaking, when you're doing a monologue, when you're performing, uh, there's two things you got to know, right? You got to know who you're talking to and what you want, right? Who you're talking to and what you want. <laughs> Those are the two things that have to be in your head the whole time you're speaking, because that's what people do, right? What people do when we, when we talk, when we have conversations, we always know those two things. We know who we're talking to, and we know what we want from that person. So let me ask you, Jack, who are you talking to, and what do you want? Um, so like maybe a friend. Great. Like trying to like explain to them what just happened and what you want is like for them to believe that there's like an elephant in your house. Great. Actually, that's, that's terrific. Um, now I'll take it a step further. Now that we know that it's um, a friend, because it felt a little bit to me like you were speaking kind of to a group of people when you were performing earlier. So yeah. now I want you to focus on one person and I don't want it just to be a friend. I want you to decide who that friend is. Um, yeah. so who is a friend in real life that you would immediately go to if something insane happened? Like if something crazy happened at home, who would you go to and be like, dude, oh my gosh, you will never believe this. Like, who would you go to? It's Probably me. my big sister, Eliza. Your big sister, Eliza. Okay. So you would go to Eliza and be like, Eliza, 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 listen up. Okay. I don't even, I can't listen. Mom and dad were talking about a freaking elephant like in our house. Okay, right? So, so let's focus on Eliza. Let's make her the person you're talking to. That way you can visualize who you're talking to because it's always easier to perform. It's always easier to have a conversation when you visualize, when you know who you're talking to. So that's number one. So let's talk to Eliza the whole time. Uh, number two, what do you want from Eliza specifically? What do you want her to do? What do you want her to say with this information? Um, like, go help you out and see if there actually is an elephant in the oh, house. Perfect. Okay, so you want something from her? It's not. I was uh, at first when you said I want you know them to believe me. I was like, ah, oh, that's okay. Um, but it's more passive, and it's always better if we have something active. Active is always better because it's easier um, for us as performers to latch onto. So now you have something active that you want from her. You want help. That's what you want from her. You want her to help you. That is excellent. That will ground everything so much more. Hey, and also everybody else, if you're not performing, will you mute for me? I just wanna to talk to Jack right now. I don't wanna hear anything else. That'd be great. All right, so Jack, let's go back to the beginning and uh, I want you to just start again 
with a very specific person in mind and with a very specific desire from that person. Just start from the top. Okay. I have finally confirmed it. Our parents are crazy. Last night, I heard them arguing and they were talking really quiet. So naturally, I snuck up to the room and listened in. That's when I heard my mom say, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay, what? okay, good. So now that's, that's a step better. That's a step in the right direction. Now I want you to, you know what I want you to do? Um, you remember that really crazy exercise that I uh, mentioned last time where I said, uh, I, when I get into a rut of saying things in the same vocal patterns, because let me just ask you, how many times have you performed this? How long have you been working on it? A long time. <laughs> a long time. So yeah. you have in your head, you know exactly what you what you want each sentence to sound like, which is great because it means that you have practiced and you have rehearsed. But the tricky part is then your voice gets into habits. So I want you to say the first line using the very highest note in your voice and, uh, and then uh, the first syllable, the very highest note in your voice, and then the second syllable, the very lowest note in your voice. So what's the first line? I'll demonstrate it for you. What's the first sentence? Um, I finally I confirmed it. Or finally I confirmed it. So this will sound ridiculous, but this is what I want you to do. I finally confirmed it. Our parents are great. Will you do that for me? I am. No, even lower. Not in your head voice. There you go. And it doesn't have to be one note. Keep going. Okay, good. Now say that first line. I have finally confirmed it. Our parents are crazy. Listen to that. Do you hear what just happened? You, the first three times you said that line to me, you said them exactly the same. We did one little trick of the mind, and now you've gotten out of the habit that you just, uh, that you have had. You said it different, and you know what else? It was more honest. It was much more honest. And what we want as an audience is we want honesty. So um, I want you to do it again. Uh, no, you know what? I'm sorry to make you do this in front of all of your friends, but will you do the second line with that exercise? What's the second line? Um, I finally confirmed that our parents are crazy. Our parents After are crazy. that, um, what's the next one? <laughs> last night I heard them arguing. Last, last night, night I, I heard them arguing. arguing. I want you to go on. I want you to do just this for a little bit longer. Keep going. Last no night. There you go. And you're not singing it. You're speaking it. Speak it. You don't have to sing it. Last. Wait. Last night. Heard them arguing. Yeah, you uh, you look and sound ridiculous. Um, no, come on, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I would actually tr truly recommend to you to go through the whole monologue that way, especially on lines that you find yourself unable to do any other line reading. I would go through those spots and do that. Now, start back at the beginning. Um, start at the beginning and, and just start again. Talk to Eliza, talk to one point. Don't move your eyes around. Talk to one point, go. I have finally confirmed it. Our parents are crazy. Last night, I heard them arguing and they were talking really quiet. So naturally, I snuck up to the room and listened in. That's when I heard my mom say, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What? I've never seen an elephant in their room or even in our house. Obviously, we would all know if there was an elephant in their room. Then my dad said, shh, the kids were here. Like he didn't want us to know there was an elephant in there either. Okay, so now think about when you're, when you're doing your parents' voices. Um, let's see, I just wanna make it a little less presentational. How would you say it to Eliza? That's what we need to get to. When you're, instead of being like, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, it, it needs to be, you know, like, oh, you, Eliza, you'll never believe this. Mo then mom said, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. If you were saying it to Eliza, would you impersonate your mom that way? Or how would you do it? I would just like say the words that she said usually. Yes, exactly. That's what you would do. 
So because that's what people do, that's what I want you to do in the monologue. And I understand the impetus for wanting to like do a funny voice because then we think, oh, that's performing. You know, I'm taking on a voice. But in real life, that's not what you would do. So as soon as you do that, me as the audience, I don't believe you. And what, what's gonna make this story funniest is if I believe you, right? So how would you say to Eliza, how would you say what your mom said? Honey, she, then our mom said, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Wait, is Eliza there? Where's Eliza? Is she there in your house? Yeah. Get She's her. On, I'm right here. Eliza. I'm on the video. No, I don't want you on the video. Come, come next to Jack. Can you come to Jack? Sure. This will be better. I want you to talk to her. Because if I were there with you, I would get up in your face and make you talk to me. But since I can't, and this works out since she's the one that you would tell this crazy story to. So, okay, I don't want you to look at me. Hi, Eliza. Um, I don't want you to look at me, Jack. I want you to look at her. And I just want you to tell her this story, okay? So you're not performing. You're just telling her this story. Start at the you beginning. Okay. I have finally confirmed it. My parents are crazy. Last night. I heard them arguing and they were talking really quiet. So naturally, I snuck into the room and listened in. That's when I heard her mom say, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What? I've never seen an elephant in their room or even in her house. Obviously, we would all know if there was an elephant in their room. And my dad said, shh, the kids will hear. Like he didn't want us to know there was an elephant in there either. So apparently- Yes, see look, this is already so much better. It's funnier because I believe you. Now, the other thing you gotta do with a monologue, uh, because it's a monologue and it's one, it's you just talking, 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 but in real life, we don't typically do that, do we? Like in real life, um, we don't typically speak for five or 10 minutes to a person without them saying anything in response, right? So you have to know in your mind where that person would interject. So when you start this story and you say, um, okay, so, so I heard them talking and uh, mom said, honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. You have to imagine that in your mind, Eliza would, well, Eliza, what would you say at that point? Let's talk about the elephant would, in the room. I don't know. Maybe I would, it depends on like what age, like if I was just you're like. Right. Okay, you're right. So let's pretend like you don't know what the idiom an elephant in the room means. I'd be like, really? Like, yeah, really you like would say okay. something. Yeah, you'd be surprised. She'd be like, wait, 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 what? Like an an elephant? Like an yeah. elephant, right? If you didn't know what that idiom meant, that's how you would respond. Yeah. Now, Jack, yeah. you have to know in your mind that somebody is responding to you, even if not with words, they're responding visually. Because when I listen to somebody tell a story, I'm gonna respond one way or another. I'm gonna be like, right? And that's how we get cues as, as people, we get cues from people to see if they're following, if they're tracking what we're saying, right? So you, as a performer, have to respond to those cues, which means you have to create them because you don't actually have somebody in front of you. Now, in this case, we're gonna use Eliza, and then we're gonna move on to somebody else, aren't we? Hey, Mr. Wright, are we gonna move? How many people do we have total? Mr. Wright. Yeah, one second. Oh, okay. Because I could do this all day, Jack. I could do this all day. Um, I just want to make sure we get to enough people. We also have one more session, Mr. Wright, you know, if we need to spread it out over two. Um, I can't unmute. We can I hear can, you. I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, great. So we have at least um, two more performers today. Um, so you can take about another five minutes with Jack if you'd like. Okay, perfect. Will you do me a favor, Mr. Wright? Will you just kind of stop me? Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Excellent. We'll do. Okay. So Jack uh, and Eliza, I want you to uh, pick up where you, I'll uh, pick up with mom, pick up with mom. And Eliza, I want you to imagine that you don't know what the idiom means, an elephant in the room. And I want you to kind of respond with some words. But, but okay. visually, the way you would respond, just so we get an idea. So Jack gets an idea. Jack, don't perform okay. it to me, just tell her the story. And then she said, 
Honey, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Elephant? <laughs> I know, elephant. And yeah, keep and going, keep going. And dad said, shh, the kids will hear. Like he didn't want us to know there's an elephant in there either. So apparently they both think there's an elephant in the room. And so I crept up to the crack in the door jam and I looked through and I could see mom sitting on the bed and dad across from her. And sure enough, no elephant. <laughs> well, then why were they talking about an elephant in the room? I don't know. And then. Keep going. Yeah, no, that's good. And it's and hard. Then, this is a hard exercise. Yeah. Keep going. And then dad said something I couldn't hear. And then mom sounded really mad and said, what's well, crazy you prefer her to me? So apparently the elephant is a girl elephant? Wait, you I, know what? Instead of, um, I'm trying to think about how you would actually say that though, right? There's a moment of discovery there. What if instead of, because you seem so like, it's a girl? Like, this is impossible. But you know that elephants can be girls, right? Yeah. So instead, yeah. what, if, what if it's a moment of discovery? Like, so apparently it's a girl elephant. Like you just discovered yeah. something, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, what if that's the moment of discovery? Yeah. So go like the line before it. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's the line before it? Get into it. Um, uh, uh, I know. It's, it, um, you prefer her to me. So apparently, so, so, apparently, then so you prefer really her to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then mom said, so apparently you prefer her to me. So apparently the elephant is a girl elephant. Excellent. Keep going. And then my dad sounded really mad too and said, I work with her. What? My dad's, our dad's an accountant. Yes. 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 Tomorrow after school. I'm gonna sneak in there once and for all. And I'm gonna bring my big sister with me. All yes. Right. Let's go ahead and uh, transition. Yeah, let me just let me just say though, do you feel the honesty there, Jack? Like, yeah. do you feel the difference? And mm -hmm. do, do you know that that is the key to comedy? The key yeah. to comedy is honesty. Because the moment that you start being presentational and the moment that I don't believe you, then it's not funny. It's funny that you're doing voices and it's funny that you're gesturing wildly, but you gotta trust the material. And if the material is funny, all you have to do is say the words the way people would say them, right? Yeah. So you insert pauses in, in specific moments, but you don't have to do too much. And you are now at the point, you're at the next level, Jack. Like You can do a performance, I have no doubt about that. Um, now what I want to see is honesty from you. That will take your game to like the next level. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, keep Excellent. going. All right, Matea and Aria. And then Stella, you're going to perform for us today as well, right? Uh, if there's enough time, I will. Excellent, good. All right, um, let's go, Matea and Aria. Okay. You're my very best friend. You're amazing. Wait, I'm sorry, can you start over? Yeah, okay. Kelly, you're my very best friend. You're amazing. Kimmy, you know I feel the same way about you. Kelly, I will always love you. I mean it. You know, Bridget, she gave me one of those little school-sized photos, and on the back of it she said, best friends forever, but she doesn't really mean it. She was just writing that. She wrote that on mine, too. No way! Yes way. See, that's what I mean. Some friends just go around writing that stuff and saying that stuff to everybody, but then they don't mean it. Whenever I read it to you, whenever I put it on the school photo I give to you, you know I mean it. Kimmy and Kelly, Kelly best best friends, friends always, always, forever, and ever, amen. <laughs> See, that shows what amazing friends we are. When we finish each other's sentences. Yes, like we're one person. Inside two bodies. Yes, see, sometimes when I'm talking to you, I just feel like I'm talking to myself. I know what you mean. And I can't count the number of times we've worn practically exactly the same outfit to school, and we didn't even call each other. I know. And we have the same taste in food, same taste in music, the same taste in fashion, same taste in guys. Yeah, we do, don't we? <laughs> I remember that we're the luckiest two people on earth to have each other as best friends. 
I remember that first day I met you in kindergarten. It was like the clouds parting, the sun shined through, and I knew we were going to be like twins. Yeah, we both had the Powerpuff Girls coloring book, and what color was it that was missing from our crayon set? Yellow. Yellow. <laughs> that was amazing. We both had the same crayon missing. Fate. Destiny. True, true friendship. We're going to the same college, aren't we? You better believe it, and we'll both major in psychology. And become famous psychologists. And we can have offices next door to each other, and it can be Kimmy and Kelly, best friend psychologist. I like that. That's perfect. You're perfect, Kelly. So are you, Kimmy. But you know what, Kelly? What, Kimmy? If I ever catch you flirting with Marco again, none of that will matter. <laughs> what? You know what I'm talking about. If anybody was flirting with anybody, he was flirting with me. I can't help it if he finds me attractive. Attractive? Now why did he find a fat cow attractive? Because I have no idea. Maybe it's because he's stuck with a bloated, self-centered witch. Me self-centered? Look who's talking, Miss Drama Queen. Oh, look in the mirror, why don't you? You make me sick. Stay away from Marco. Make me. I hate you. Not as much as I hate you. All right. Wow. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Great work. Um, again, if you're not performing, if you could just mute for me, I would appreciate because then I, especially now, because I got to go back and forth between these two. Okay, wait. So who is it? It's uh, Aria. Is that right? Yeah. And Mat wait, wait, where are you? What's your What's your name? Where are you? Matea. Yes, sir. Aria and Matea. Oh wait, there we are. Okay, good. I just wanted to get you where I could see you. Okay, this is a fun scene, and you guys do it very well already. I want to take it to the next level, and most of it has to do with what I was talking to Jack about. In that. I want to make it less presentational and I want to make it more honest because that will make it funnier, right? Um, this goes, this is a wide range uh, because we go from best friends to I hate you and name calling by the end. And that's what's funny about it. Now I have to believe that we get to that progression. Um, so, you know what? We've got one of our questions already answered. Who are you talking to and what do you want? So, Matea, who are you talking to? Uh, Kelly. You're talking Aria. to Kelly. And what do you want from her? Conversation? Like, I don't... I'm... Okay, okay. Uh, yes. You mean you guys are just, like, shooting the breeze and then this comes up? And then um, from Marco. You want what? And then afterwards, I want her to stay away from Marco and to stop flirting with him. Okay. Uh, all right, what do, you, what do you want? Um, I, I guess to kind of be like, well, no, I wasn't flirting. Like, to set the record straight, I guess, with her. Okay, so who do we think is the aggressor here? It's probably Matea, right? Like, is she the one that says it first? Who says it first? Who says... Um, we have the same taste in men. That first, like, oh, that's break. me. <laughs> I say we have the same taste in fashion, the same taste in guys, and she goes, "Hmm, yeah, we do, don't we?" Oh, okay, okay. So maybe is that innocent? Do you think that's an innocent? When you say we have the same taste in guys, no, it can't be this. That that can't be innocent because in real life, if a friend said that to you, like, oh, we have the same taste in fashion the same taste in guys, like that would make your ears perk up, right? Yeah. And it probably wouldn't be innocent, would it? Probably not, no. So my, my guess is about this conversation is that this has been brewing for a long time and that you probably both know that this is coming. Like you guys are best friends, yes, but I will kill you. <laughs> Right? Like that needs to be the underlying force behind this conversation. I don't think it can just be, I want conversation. 
I don't think that is a strong enough want um, because kind of the rule of thumb for any performance is um, uh, the, the age old question, what makes tonight different than any other night, right? Well, what makes this conversation different than any other conversation? Why are we as an audience watching this conversation? It can't just be because it's a normal everyday conversation. That's not interesting. That's not worth me investing my time in. Anytime you watch something on television um, or in a show or, or anything, it's because something is different. There is a reason for me, um, there's something that makes this conversation special, right? Yeah. It's the same with this conversation. There's something special about this. Maybe you've had a thousand conversations before this about the Powderpuff Girls and about, oh my God, we were both missing the yellow crayon. Like you guys have had that conversation before. Maybe what you haven't had is this conversation about a guy. That's what makes this conversation different. So I think you both have to know from the beginning of the conversation that there's trouble in paradise. And I think there, there, if there's something underlying, then it makes it more interesting. So can we go back to the beginning? And can you just keep that in mind? I'm not even gonna like ask you to change anything. I'm just gonna say, keep in mind the fact that you know something is coming and that this, this is maybe all a facade. Start again. Kelly, you're my very best friend. You're amazing. Kimmy, you know I feel the same way about you. Kelly, I will always love you. I mean it. You know, Bridget, she gave me one of those little school size photos, and on the back of it she said, best friends forever, but she doesn't really mean it. She was just writing that. Okay, now how would you say this whole opening, how would you say this to your friend? Like, how would you just... How would you say it? Like, say the first line to me. Kelly, you're my very best friend. No, 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 no. How would you say it to, how, who, how would you say it to a person? You wouldn't actually be like, Kelly, you are my very best friend. If it was you, you'd be like, Kelly, you are my very best friend. Like, it would be, a, a, like, why, why would you, why else would you say this to a person? If you, if you talk to your best friend in the hallway at school, like, it would feel weird if you walked up to her and said, Kelly, you are my very best friend. They'd be like, are you high? Like, what <laughs> is, like, why are you acting so weird, right? Now, how would you say it for real? How would you say it for real? Say, say the line the way you would say it as a person. Kelly, you're my very best friend. You're amazing. Okay, Kimmy. better. Keep going. Kimmy, I feel the same way about you. Kimmy, now that, doesn't that have to be a, a surprise too? Or like, oh, Kimmy, I, I feel the same way about you, right? Like you don't know that this is coming. The other thing you always, everybody, this is for everybody. You always have to remember, this is the first time you've ever said these words. Anytime you're performing, this is the first time you've said these words. So you have to discover them as they come out because that's what we do as people. As we talk, we discover what words we're going to say. We don't know what words we're gonna say. Even when, when, when I start a sentence, I don't know how the sentence is going to end, right? You have to discover the words as they come out of your mouth. Right now, it feels like you have memorized lines. I want you to discover words as they come out of your mouth. About um, three more minutes. So how many minutes? Three more minutes. With this. Oh my gosh, I could do that. Okay, then let's get to then let's get to the moment of discovery. Let's get to the guys. We have um, uh, we have the same taste in bunk, bunk, and guys. Can you go to that moment for me? Okay. Um, the same. Wait. Here, say your line, Matea. Okay. Um, we have the same taste in music. Same taste in foods. The same taste in fashion. The same taste in guys. Yeah, we do, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't you think that would be more pointed, like the same taste in fashions, the same taste in guys? Like, what do you want from that? Why are you saying that? Do you want to start a fight? Do you want to have this conversation? Maybe it's that you, like, you don't know how to broach this conversation, right? So how would you say it in real life? How would you bring something up that's this awkward? How would you say the line? I don't know. Okay, I want you to say to your friend, I want you to imagine, go off script completely. I want you to tell me, your best friend, something awkward, which is, we are both crushing on the same person. How would you start, how would you have that conversation? 
I want you to like, just imagine, t tell me, hey, right, how you doing? What's going on? Anything new today? Um, well, I don't know. Um, there's, um, there's this guy, you know, you know him. Um, yeah. Wait, oh, you're talking about Caleb? I mean, yeah, he and I kind of have a thing. Why? Well, you know, I mean, I kind of thought I was going to be with him, not you, so. Oh. Uh, huh. Huh. Because I feel like there's a real connection between Caleb and me. Like, when yeah, he looks no, into no. my eyes, I look into his eyes. I just feel like maybe, ooh, gosh, this is kind of awkward, isn't it? Yeah, just a little. Um, but I just, I kind of feel like he doesn't really like you. Like, he just seems to kind of favor me a little bit more, I think. <laughs> Wow. Okay. See, now this is good because that's how maybe that's how the conversation might go a little bit more in real life, right? I want you girls to take that. And I think a good exercise for you to do would be to do what we just did. I want you guys to drop the script completely. And I want you to role play. I want you to imagine that you're both going after the same guy. And I want you just to have a conversation the way you would if that was actually happening. And then I want you to take that. I want you to do the high-low exercise um, on the whole script, on every line that you have, because you guys are very in, you're in tracks right now. Like, this is how I say this line. This is how I say this line. I want you to get out of that. And then I want you to take the honesty of what the conversation would actually be, and I want you to put it on the scene. Honesty is going to be much more interesting. It will make the audience, first of all, you have a great opportunity with the scene to make the audience uncomfortable which is what you want, and then to make them laugh. That's what, th those are your goals, right? Is that's what makes this conversation different than anything else. So um, I just want you to drop any pretenses, and I want this to be a conversation that I believe could actually happen. Yeah, that's your next assignment. Role play and have that conversation with each other. Good uh -huh. work, though, really good work. Awesome, so um, hey, Emily Johnson, can you unmute for one second? Well, that's okay. I'll ask you a question. You can just go ahead and give me a, a thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, I'm next, here. I'm okay. here myself. So next week, would you be willing to do the monologue that you did for dinner theater? Um, I, I say that, one, because you're an eighth grader, but also um, it's in contrast to anything we've seen so far today. Okay, because what, what she's got, Jeff, is one that uh, gets pretty emotional. And so it'd be nice to go a different route than comedy, um, just so we had uh, balance. I've got Stella that's going to do – Stella's in seventh grade. And, and by the way, Matea and Aria, they're in eighth grade. Um, so they'll be going to Pinecrest next year. Uh, Stella is a seventh grader, and so um, Stella is going to perform her monologue for us, and it, it is still along the comedy uh, genre. Stella. Uh, Mr. Yes. Wright. Yes. Who, who spoke? Uh, me, Patrick. Yes, Patrick. So I have two. One's comedy, and one's like kind of sad. It's about a guy finding out his best friend is is with his wife. I would say just uh, keep practicing which one that sits on your heart the most and then uh, present the one that you feel most comfortable with. Okay. Does that sound about right, Mr. Craven? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Stella. Yes. Let's go. Okay. This is how I imagine my first breakup to go. I'm sorry. It's not you. It's me. I feel our connection has been lost and I have fallen for someone else. I want to break up with you. What? Why? Why me? I thought you loved me. I guess it was wrong. This is how it actually went. So, um, <laughs> I want to break up with you. <laughs> um, cool. And this is how I imagine my marriage proposal to go. You are the love of my life. You are the one. We belong together forever. You make me happy every day. I love you. Will you marry me? I'm 
OG, 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 yes, of course, I love you. And this is how it actually went. Oh, <laughs> that's right, I'm still waiting. I hope my life takes a big twist because at the pace that it's going, I'm going to end up like the old lady across the street with 40 cats and zero husband. All right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, great. At first I thought, oh, this is too presentational. This is over the top. But actually that is part of what, that's going to be where our comedy is, isn't it? Um, uh, you know what? Start again. Let's just start again. Okay. This is how I imagined my first breakup to go. I'm sorry. It's not you. It's me. I feel our connection has been lost and I've fallen for someone else. I want to break up with you. What? Why? Why me? I thought you loved me. I guess it was wrong. Okay, good. Who are you telling this story to? I was thinking about that earlier when you asked the other people. I guess, like, I want to say, like, the audience, but then I'm not, like... I don't know, like, nah, it, it'd be kind of weird if I said it to like a friend or something, so. I see, I see what you're saying. Um, because if it's a friend, okay, well then let's do this. It's always easier to perform to one person instead of to a group of people. Um, it, it makes your task, it makes your job easier. So the only reason I'm trying to find one person is because it, it, is, it will be simpler. So uh, let's not say an audience, but instead of saying your friend, because I see what you're saying, you know what? Then let's make it somebody you don't know very well. Most of the time I say a monologue is easiest delivered to your best friend, somebody who knows you really well, because most of the time you're telling intimate details about yourself or you're telling a story that you would tell a friend. But in this case, it might be, it might be acceptable to say you're telling this uh, story to somebody you met on an airplane, like somebody that you don't know, right? Yeah. Somebody that you're making conversation with. So uh, let, let's just imagine that that's the world you're in. Okay, so let's say you're on an airplane, um, you're, you're traveling alone, your seat partner next to you. Uh, I don't know, is it a guy or a girl? Who, who do you think you're telling this story to? Is this, this is kind of like girl talk? Yeah, usually? probably a girl, I would say. Okay, so let's say you're on the plane. Yeah, that's good. Let's say you're on the plane. You're still getting to know this person, of course, because you've just met. It started because she was like, oh, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind. Um, I've got my bag. It's pretty big under here. I'm sorry if I'm like accidentally taking up a little bit of your leg room. And you're like, oh, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. Like, she seems really nice and you're totally cool. And um, oh, gosh, we're delayed. Okay, so you're like making small talk, right? Mm -hmm. So put yourself in that mindset. And then after an hour of small talk, you get to, as happens with people when you're first getting to know them, sometimes it's easier to divulge these secrets to a stranger than to somebody you know really well, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is kind of intimate, but it's something that would be embarrassing to talk about with like one of your good friends, right? But if it's yeah. a stranger, those, st those stakes are gone. So let's imagine you're telling the story to a stranger, number one. What do you want the stranger, what do you want this person to do? Like, what do you want from the person? Um, well, I mean, like, the actual monologue, like, it's obviously, like, comedy. So, like, if I'm actually speaking to someone, probably, like, in this situation, maybe, like, give me advice about it. Yeah, okay, great. To, to give you advice um, or, or to sympathize with you, to be, like, because at the end, when you say, I'm going to end up like the cat lady, and you ultimately, what you want is for her to be like, no, 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 no. Look, everything's going to be fine. You're not going to be a crazy old cat lady. Like, that's what you would want a stranger to do, to, to yeah. encourage you, right? So you need, you're feeling low. So let's go at it from that point of view. Also, I like the way you've blocked it. It's funny. You're funny. You have natural um, comedic chops, which I appreciate. But I want you to cut it out for right now. Maybe we add it back in later. But right now... Don't do your, don't do the blocking. Don't get down on a knee. Don't turn side to side. Tell the story to me, your friend Caroline, who you just met on the plane. Um, and just tell the story the way you would tell a story. Go ahead. Start again. Okay. All right. So this is how I imagine. Oh, sorry. My do you want any peanuts? She, she's asking. Do you want any peanuts? Hey, um, uh, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. So. Okay. No, no, no. I actually, could I have like a, a cranberry juice? Thank you. Oh yeah. Sorry. What were you saying? Um, okay. So I kind of need some advice on something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Totally. Okay. So, so first, this is kind of how I wanted my first breakup to go. So he would be like, wait, how you wanted your breakup to go? Like you were hoping your breakup would go a certain way. I mean, I wanted to be like him, like still loving me, but like, you know, dramatic. Uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like how? So I want him to be like, I'm sorry. Like, it's not you, it's me, you know? So I don't feel bad. Right. I feel like our connection has been lost and I've fallen like for someone else. I want to break up with you. So like, I don't feel bad. And then I'd be super dramatic because, you know, I want him to still feel bad. And I'd be like, right. Right. I thought you loved me. I guess I was wrong. You know. Right. right. And then right. you'd like really lay it on him and then make him feel the guilt because there's right. somebody yeah. else. Absolutely. But of course, that's not how it went. And this oh, is how, how did it actually go? went. So it was super awkward. He was just like, so like, I want to break up with you. What? I know. Right. What did you right? say? Right. And I was just like, I don't know what to say. So I was like, uh, cool, I guess. Okay. But, but okay, good. Pause. Do you feel the difference? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there is an honesty now that will make it much more believable and much funnier. Um, now, when you impersonate yourself and you're like, oh, cool. But in actuality, how would you tell me? And then I said, cool. You know, right? Like, how would you impersonate yourself? Don't do a characterization of yourself. How would you say that if you said, and then I said, how would you say it? I, uh, I'd be like, um, cool. <laughs> yes, cool. yes, yes. See, now that is funny. That's funny. Everybody, do you see that? It's funnier if you just say it the way you would say it. You don't have to do voices. You don't have to do something over the top. That is what's funny. Um, so I guess I want to leave time for a Q&A. Right. Uh, and so, but honestly... You're very talented and you are very, I can see that comedy, like you you get comedy, um, but you have to cut everything superfluous out. Okay. And I want you to go through, your assignment is to go through this um, and just tell the story the way you would tell it to a stranger on an airplane. <laughs> and then incorporate that into how you perform it. Okay. Good work. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so we did have a session yesterday, and I asked them uh, to tell me some of the questions that they might have for you. And there were some very good questions out there. Oh, great. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Eliza, so, go ahead. Um, for like, what is your um, best like tips for like audition materials and stuff like that? Ah, oh, addition materials. Um, my best tip is to 100% memorize your auditions. Don't memorize how you're going to say the words, but memorize the words because you can't start playing. You can't create a character until you're out of the script. And that's tricky because a lot of times for me, I get my, my audition material the day before. Sometimes my agent calls with an audition and says, you have an audition tomorrow at four o'clock and I have one night to learn a monologue or you know, 14 pages of sides. That's not uncommon. Um, but I have to drop everything and memorize them because I can't play, I can't give them a sense of what I will do unless my face is out of the script. So my number one advice would be commit yourself to every audition enough to memorize it. Um, now that doesn't mean don't hold the sides, hold on to your script as you go into the audition room for two reasons. Number one, so that when you do forget because you'll be nervous and you will forget, you can glance down and pick up the word and then keep going. Um, and number two, if you don't have the sides in your hands, if you don't have the script in your hand, um, then it comes off as if this is a finished product, right? The, uh, the, the people behind the table will, it, when you hold the script, it lets them know that this is still a work in, in progress, right? So um, my number one advice would be memorize as best you can and know that you're probably not going to be able to do whatever you can do at home. My wife, Nikki, and I always talk about this when we have auditions. Um, whenever we go into the room, just know you're gonna be nervous and things are gonna happen and you're not gonna do 100% of what you're capable of doing. Uh, if you can do 80% of what you're capable of doing 
in the room when you have nerves, then that's a win. And don't beat yourself up for not doing 100%. Our goal as performers is to get comfortable enough in an audition in a high pressure situation that we can creep that percentage up. And man, there's times if I feel like I've gone in and done 95% of what I'm capable of doing, that is a huge victory. And my wife and I celebrate that. It's like, oh my God, I gave like a 90% audition. And then we're like, yes, that's great. So just know you're not gonna do your best. You're not gonna do what you're capable of doing, right, in the room. Um, but give yourself as many opportunities as you can to, to increase that percentage. That would be my number one bit of advice for auditions. What's your strategy when memorizing? Uh, when memorizing, for me, I mean, everybody's different. Know that it is a muscle. It is like any other muscle. The more that you flex it, the easier it will be, the more you will be able to lift mentally. Um, so for me, what I do is I've got my, my monologue. I go through and I read the first line of the monologue. And I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And after I've read it, you know, 20 times, I say, okay, can I say the first half of that line without looking at it? And if, it, uh, if the line is, yesterday I went to the park, then I read, yesterday I went to the park, yesterday I went to the park. Okay, can I say that line without looking at it? Yesterday I went to the park. Okay, I've got the first line memorized. Then I read the second line. Then I see if I can say the first line and the second line together. And I go through systematically, and it is tedious as heck, but for me, that's what I have to do to memorize. And I so, have not found anything else that's more effective. So, so you don't even worry about the context of the, the paragraph? No, I, first thing you do is you're gonna read the whole script. You know, you're gonna read your whole, the whole scene for sure so you have an idea about where it's going. Um, but once you're trying to memorize, and it is important to memorize word for word, it is uh, very tacky to paraphrase. And if you go to an audition where the writer is in the room, they're not gonna like that. Sure. Uh, they, they wrote those words for a reason and paraphrasing lines is not acceptable. Uh, it is important to memorize the line the way it is written because they work very hard to have every and, but, and, or exactly, you know, they thought about where to put that comma and there's a reason for it. So, uh, yes, I mem you know, you think about the bigger picture, but then you memorize word for word. Wonderful. Others? Um, my question is, what is your favorite role ever for, from being on Broadway? Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to have a cop-out answer for this, but it's true for me. Honestly, whatever I'm working on at the moment is the thing that I get, I get really excited about it. And I guess Les Mis will always have a special place in my heart because that was my Broadway debut. That's the show where I met my wife. Um, and so that show has a special place certainly, and in some ways, nothing will ever top Les Mis. Um, but then when I was doing Billy Elliot for a thousand performances, that became my most favorite job. When I did Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, I got to play a serial killer that I had to convince the audience to love. And when I was doing that show, I could think of no greater task that I had ever had as a performer. So that became my favorite role. I did the worst off-Broadway show that's ever existed, called Attack of the Elvis Impersonators. And when I was working on that off-Broadway show, um, I actually loved it very much <laughs> and I committed to it. So I think it's important to commit 100% to whatever you're working on. Um, because if you have that kind of dedication and if you have that kind of passion for the role, uh, that's the only way that you can do your very best performance. Honestly, that's what I think. So it's kind of a cop-out answer, but it's my truth. So I'm going to ask another question, too, because I know not only do you uh, act on, uh, on stage, but you also do TV acting. Uh, yes. Can you talk about the difference between um, how, how you approach both? Sure. Um, TV acting is uh, – working on TV is really boring. That's what I will say about that. I only do it for money. <laughs> I don't do it because I enjoy it. Um, but I will take any TV job I can get. Um, TV, one key is, um, somebody told me this. Oh, it was actually Audra McDonald, seven-time Tony Award winner. Um, she said, and she does a lot of TV, and she said the key for TV acting is not to show what you're feeling, but just to think it. 
And if you think to yourself, I'm excited, it will show on screen. Because you have to remember what you're dealing with when we are on, oh, hello, sorry, hey, hi. Uh, when we're dealing with, um, hello. hi to everybody. Hi. Um, Luis, um, here, okay, can you go to mommy for just a minute? I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Uh, when you're on TV, the shot is like in your face. And when you're acting this close, every move of your eye, it, like if I'm thinking about something and then I go, like that's a big move on screen because you got to remember that people are watching you with a 65 inch TV. So everything has to be muted and it's all about what you're thinking and it's about it being in your eyes. So you do a lot less for TV acting than you do, um, not necessarily less, it's just focused in a different way. Who's on stage, smaller dress with the TV? Yeah, yeah, I guess in a, in a, in a broad sense, that's true, okay. absolutely. How about one or two more questions, then we'll wrap up. I got, I got, I got one. Um, let's go with uh, Josh. Um, so this is kind of like Jack's question. What's the character that you like relate to the most that you've played? Um, that I relate to the most. Uh, you know, I got to. You know, I got to originate a role, which is really. People ask, "What's your dream role?" I don't really have a dream role necessarily, other than I want to. I want to create something and I want to play a role that nobody else has ever played before. And I did get to do that. I'd love to do that on Broadway someday with a new show because when you create a role, it becomes you and you have a lot of say over how that character behaves. But I did get to uh, do a world premiere of a show called In This House and that character, I got a lot of say over how he responded to things. And so he responded to the stimulus the way I would respond and because I got to say, you know, the writers were in the room and they said, well, what do you think should happen here? And I'd be, I'd get to say things like, well, if it was me, I would say, absolutely not. You know, screw you. I'm, I'm out of here. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, like, so I got to make big decisions about where the play went and how the character responded. And so he, I guess, in a lot of ways is the character that I related to the most because he was the most like me. And that's what every actor wants to do, is play a role that's the most like them, um, you know, because then you get to be really honest on stage, right? How about one final question, we'll wrap up. Um, Tara. So, let's say you're doing like a two hour show and it's a musical. How often should you like practice the songs? What do you mean? How often should you practice the songs? Oh, you, you mean, uh, how long should you rehearse beforehand? Yeah, like how long should you like rehearse the songs, like before you go on stage or something? Oh well, you know, rehearsal really kind of depends. When you're doing professional theater, you get as much rehearsal as your production has money. So when you're doing small summer stock regional theater, you get five six days of rehearsal. Um, when you're doing a big Broadway show, you may get four months of rehearsal because your show has twenty million dollars behind it. So really, rehearsal time is dependent on how much money your production has in a from a business standpoint but it doesn't change what your preparation is um i come to rehearsals for any show as much off book as i can be especially when you're doing a short rehearsal period when you're doing six days of rehearsal you can't come in and not know your lines and your music you've got to know everything in advance so you should spend as much time rehearsing that as it takes for you to be in the best place to perform so that i suppose it's totally up to you Okay. That's wonderful. So one of the things that you continue to hit on is the need to be prepared, to take your job seriously enough that you're prepared. Um, Dr. Herrick does the same thing all the time. You can't, you can't really start to act until you're memorized. Absolutely. So I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to next week's session. You and I can go ahead and uh, chat later and figure out what the, the best uh, day and time will be. Um, and then we'll go ahead and spread the news to uh, the, the students. But uh, everybody, would you say thank you to, to Mr. Crady? Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Great work today, guys. Great work. The, uh, the, the session was fantastic. I really enjoy watching you work with them. So um, I do appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the record off real quickly. My kitty cat says bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. All right, let's see. Thanks. Bye. Hey, Anna, do you have a pug? 
Yeah. I want a pug. Oh, thank you. All right. Stop recording.